Good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right. This particular topic is one that has actually great interest from different venues where I've presented it before. And actually, I've been updating this material quite, quite a bit because I actually have been doing this for some time when it comes to commercial products. And there is a handout associated with this so you guys can follow along. And for those of you who are on GoToMeeting, I believe we're also displaying the presentation, no? No, um, no. I, I'm not there So yet. the alternative <laughs> is that you can actually go to SlideShare because this entire slide deck is already posted. So you can actually look me up by name and look for tonight's discussion, the entire slide deck, and right now we're on a slide one, is already posted on SlideShare. And I will share where you, everybody else can actually view this afterwards if you want to refer to this material. So let me ask this question. How many of you are currently in transition, looking for your next opportunity? Show of hands. Good. How many of you are right now struggling because you're trying to pivot your careers? You're looking for, your, for a promotion and may not necessarily be with, in the company where you're at today, and you're looking for your next opportunity, even though you may be gainfully employed right now. How many of you are in that position? How many of you are starting a newly minted career as PMPs because you recently acquired your certification as pro in project management? So this has a little bit of content for all of you who are seeking to transform your careers and maybe even considering pivoting because you've been working for some time and are sort of struggling because you're not really happy. In other words, you're gainfully employed, but you're unhappy with your environment, different factors that come into play, things that you don't control, and you're not really quite happy in the environment where you're at. And I've been in that boat. I actually have been had a, a, the pleasure of had a, a, a long career, and I started in development. So, in essence, I'll share my story, and I actually will share with you why it is important to actually start really crafting your own personal story. And the fact is that this story is all about really understanding, you know, the, how do you present yourself when you are meeting someone new? And sharing things that are relevant to who you're talking in a way that they remember who you are and what you do. And this is the, the essence of what we're talking about. So this part is all about understanding why a powerful story is crucial to your career. And number two is I'm going to be sharing some tips on how you can actually craft or improve your own personal story based on developing, developing your own personal brand. So the first quote is from Robert McKee. Those of you who are not familiar with Robert McKee, he's a creative writing expert and former professor at University of Southern California that actually holds seminars that have been fantastically successful for people who are trying to do exactly the same thing, become great storytellers. And the fact is that for those that understand the power of storytelling, it's really a powerful way of sharing ideas that change the world. And I'll be giving a few examples, but this is a quote of what he's saying about storytelling and how powerful it is. And if you ever have heard the saying that the pen is mightier than the sword, this is exactly where the pen is put into action to change the world. If you're on Twitter, you can either Retweet this because I tweeted it out on my uh, HM Del Castillo Twitter account. Uh, share that information. And uh, also, this will guide you to the landing page, which is the uh, PMI Silver Spring Chapter uh, website. And you feel free to share that with those who are following you on Twitter. It's also on LinkedIn because I actually shared uh, this present, uh, the actual uh, invite to this tonight's meeting through LinkedIn earlier today. So let's get into some tips as to or some reasons why you should really consider developing and shaping, crafting your own powerful personal story. First thing is that 
A Powerful Story is really about you. You're the protagonist, you're the character, and you can choose to, to present yourself either as a superhero or as a plain person. The main thing is that you want to make sure that you're authentic because it really is about sharing with others who you are and what you do. So that's the first point is you need to be authentic and you need to be honest. And sometimes it may be a struggle because we may not necessarily be in a happy place where we can actually think of ourselves as being uh, having significance or having achievement, even though relatively speaking, we may have, you know, we may have had some successful careers. And often, if you're in an unhappy place, you need to kind of meditate and put yourself in a happy place. So sometimes doing this is hard if you haven't done it before. And the reason for that is because life happens. Changes that you don't control, that we don't like, making us unhappy and not making us feel good about ourselves and what we've done, what we've achieved. And sometimes doing this takes a lot of work to kind of figure out, okay, struggling is like, well, this is not working for me and I could highlight this, but this is not working either. So what exactly do I say about myself? It is a struggle to figure out and be authentic and define who you are when you're trying to figure out where do you start in sharing your story. A great story will also help you set you apart from somebody else, especially when you're meeting somebody new or even in the interview process. The tell me about yourself is very powerful when you start creating that story from the very beginning. And as opposed to you waiting for questions from the interviewees, you're actually controlling the interview process by sharing up front the value proposition as to why they should hire you instead of someone else and all the things that go along with that specific job for which you're interviewing for. It also helps you build credibility and trust. And for those of you who are small business owners or are consulting or perhaps in a senior management position, it really is about step one in truly having a successful team that truly collaborates when the task at hand that you have, either as a project or program manager, really requires collaboration and communication. And if you're in the lead position, it really is a requirement for those team members who you're leading to trust you and to believe what you do and what you're about. Because other than that, you're gonna struggle because you might try to lead the team and no one's following. And this is the reason why you wanna make sure that as you are building a team, as you're leading a project or a program, you wanna make sure that you're telling them that you are a trustworthy person and that you walk the talk. And it's about creating integrity, which is the step one to building a great performing team. It's also about establishing your reputation as a thought leader, as an innovator, as somebody who gets things done in projects. And often it's about sharing your experience, your knowledge with others, as opposed to you holding on to knowledge and not sharing it with others. Once you start sharing your knowledge, you will find out that a lot of people will actually open up and naturally start trusting you and start thinking about you as a thought leader, as an expert who they can come to and confide in when they're struggling with a challenge that they can't see past that challenge. And it's also a great way to express your unique value proposition. The reasons why you really belong where you're at or where you, the reasons why they need to hire you into a position that you're currently interviewing for. It's a great way to convince people that this is the best, that you're the best person for the job. It also, in the struggle that you're going through on a personal level, in defining who you are, in sharing, figuring out how you're gonna share your story about your accomplishments, your achievements, your results, that the process of doing that and having going through the struggle of doing that will actually build your self-confidence to the point where if you feel like you can't do it and then you do baby steps, 
that builds up your self-confidence. So that's kind of like a, of a more personal effect when you're not feeling very confident about your abilities, your results, your accomplishments. When you start comparing yourself to others, you really find out, hey, I've gone a long way. I may not necessarily be perfect but, or successful in my terms, but at least I've, I've achieved a lot over time. And it also helps you create a meaningful, powerful first impression when you're meeting someone new. Regardless of whether you're interviewing or looking for a new position, I find that now as I've been able to share my story and as I worked on specifically, you know, the way that I would present myself when I'm in, diff in front of different stakeholders, now they're coming to me. Like, I don't have to go out and seek anymore because now automatically I'm getting pinged on either LinkedIn or by email or Twitter or some other uh, mechanism and I'm getting asked questions because now, by sharing my, my knowledge and my expertise, people are coming to me and saying, hey, I need help in this, can you help me? And usually what I will do is I either tell them right away whether I'm in a position to help them or lead them to somebody who will help them, connect them with the right person. Bottom line, when you summarize this, and you start really looking as to why we want to present a story rather than just bullets or something that is highlights. Bottom line, neuroscience tells us that we are all wired to remember stories. That the way our brain is wired, as, long, as soon as we have a protagonist and a story and drama of life, we're all in it. And it grabs us, it engages us, and we want to know more. What's next? What happened in you know, chapter one? What happens in chapter two? And often, it's almost like when you pick up a great book that you can't stop reading because you're totally engaged. And this is a great way of being able to propose ideas, ideas that engage people, engage others, when you know that in order to execute on those ideas, you will need help and that you will need collaboration with multiple people because this is maybe about changing the world. Even if it's one project at a time, even if it starts with a person in the mirror and you project that to everyone around you in your life, across all the different roles that you play in, in life. So that's a little bit more about crafting and why it's crucial to share your own story. Now we're gonna talk about some tips, and these tips are basically to help you if you're in the process or if you have uh, currently struggling in crafting your own story or even improving your own story. What are some of the ways and techniques that you could e easily adopt? And I will share some tips that actually are on a book called Primal Branding. It's a great read. I actually uh, picked it up er earlier this year and the author kind of puts things in, th in terms that uh, we all understand. And I'm just going to give you the cliff note summary uh, of this particular bo book and summarize into seven different tips, along with some questions that where you can start in crafting or improving your own personal story. So tip number one is you've got to start where, you know, how did, all, where, where did you come from? Where have you been? And where are you at today? It's your creation story about your career. And you can choose pictures or images or even a story that is unique about you and how your career got started. Here's a picture. Does anybody know what this picture is all about? Hewlett Packard. Yes, that is correct. This is the garage where Hewlett Packard started. When Hewlett and Packard, before they even formed the company HP, this is where they started. It's a detached garage somewhere in Silicon Valley, and they're not the only ones. Actually, there's, if you look for pictures of startups, Google, Facebook, Apple, they all got started in a garage somewhere in Silicon Valley. So should I move into my garage? Exactly. Well, <laughs> perhaps you, we ought to rethink about where we work from. <laughs> But this is a, a famous picture, and it's actually shared in the biography of, of HP, the company, that this is where it all started. It started with ideas in a garage that became a multinational com company that still exists today. 
And the question that I would ask about, about your own creation is to really identify and ask, start with this question. What path did you take to get to where you are today? And just make it simple. Don't necessarily get into a lot of bills and whistles, just keep the plot simple, and then you can always add more details as needed. But it could be about how you got started as a project manager, or it could be about how you got started in your career, period. My creation story is that I started in high school, and my, um, my generation, my parents did not go to college. And I'm the oldest of three brothers. And when I was faced with decisions, I was always brought up with the intent that I will go to college. There was no choice. That was the mindset of my parents when I looked and they all had jobs, you know, with whatever they could get by, made a lot of sacrifices to ensure that myself and my brothers would have a chance to go to college and have a professional career. And it kind of, that understanding that is what really drove me, especially being the eldest, to kind of lead my brothers by example. And I prepared. In, in high school, I wanted to be a doctor back, back in those days. And in this, mostly because I have family in Mexico and other places that are doctors themselves. And so I kind of wanted to make sure that at least I would stand up to the family tradition of being a doctor. <laughs> and even though it wasn't necessary, I wasn't necessarily the brightest student in, 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 in school, I still made the decision that I was going to take the advanced courses in high school and learn as much as I could before I even exited high school because I knew that high school for me was a stepping stone that I knew that I needed to get into a great college and perhaps have a chance of having a scholarship because I knew my parents could not afford to put all three of us through college with their salaries. And that drove a lot of decisions. I actually worked, I started working before I even graduated from high school. And I'd, I was driven to learn because I found as I started working, it was great to have a little bit of money be able to save some so that I could start planning for college. Because I knew that my parents were not gonna be able to afford to put me, and then later on, my brothers who were following me by about two years, a two year gap. And that really drove me. When it came to the time of making decisions as to what I wanted to do, I started really looking for practical careers, the ones that I could very quickly start working and earning great money. And as I started talking to counselors and starting applying to schools, I had taken a lot of math, a lot of science, and a lot of the biology courses, because I really was driving towards being as prepared as possible to be in medical school. But when it all came, came to make a decision as to what I really wanted to do, I knew that naturally math came easy, became easy for me. I had taken calculus before I even graduated from high school, and granted I wasn't making the best grades, but I enjoyed this stuff. And it wasn't about me making the grade, it's about me starting to learn exactly what this was all about and what it was for. So after talking to several of my counselors and applying to the local school, has a great engineering department and I decided to go into electrical engineering. When I told my parents that I was gonna be majoring in electrical engineering, they thought, great, you can fix a refrigerator now. <laughs> so that's the story of my creation of my career because from, from there, it just basically became a te uh, technologist and was uh, in R&D for a long time and eventually started working as a sophomore before I even graduated. I started doing summer internships to be able to earn money that I can save so that I can pay for the rest of, of, of my college years. I worked for companies like Arco in Long Beach, California as an intern. Let, later on, went to Texas Instruments in Dallas, Texas when uh, TI was big. Uh, at, the, at the time, not just making calculators, but actually had huge defense contracts because they were a defense contractor and they had a lot of, of great technology that was coming out out of Dallas, Texas. And eventually I ended up at Lawrence Livermore Laboratories doing great work for DOE. 
And eventually, when I graduated with my master's, I ended up at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, NASA, in Pasadena, California. And I spent my time there for about 11 years, doing great work, working for incredible people with great brains, astrophysicists that really were the collaborators and, and com competitors with uh, Stephen Hawking and Carl Sagan and others. And I was really enjoying that. Let me move on to Creed. Number two, Creed. What is Creed? Creed is about values. It's Think about it as this being your own personal constitution that states what values attract you. And the question that you should be asking yourself as you talk about Creed is what values do you hold close to you, closest to you? Is it about happiness? Is it about having freedom? And what sort of freedom? Is it about sharing with others? Is it about being close to family and being able to share and enjoy the present with family? These are all things that could vary. You need to identify your own values and make sure that you are sharing those in your own story. The next one is icons. And icons is really about figuring out what are the things that you want people to remember you by. Perhaps it's a slogan. Perhaps it's a motto. Maybe it's a song. Here's an example of Nationwide. How many of you actually have seen those uh, Nationwide commercials, primetime, with Peyton Manning? They don't even say any words, just you know, captions, different instances, and what, what is he doing at, at all times? Humming. Humming, mm -hmm. Humming the jingle associated with Nationwide. They don't even mention the company Nationwide, they're just, you know, the jingle. <coughs> this is all part of branding. You can choose what you, whatever icon you want, and it could be a song, it could be a motto, it could be a slogan, choose something that represents you. Rituals. And rituals is all about understanding what are those great habits that you have that have made you successful? What are those rituals that set you apart and make you successful? For Serena Williams, I was rooting for her from for the first time she's about to break the record of four Grand Slams in one year. Being at the top once again after all the struggles that she's had as an athlete in her fitness level because of health issues. And the, the fact that she's strived so hard to be on top once again. And the ritual for her, if you have ever seen her, play is that every single serve, she will bounce the, the ball five times, no more, no less than five times before she actually serves the ball. Good or bad, that's a ritual. And it's become a staple for her, especially now where she's back at number one and competing at that level. Pagans. Pagans are symbols, symbols that you choose what persona, what character, what avatar you're going to be in whatever your story is. Here's an example, PC versus Mac. <laughs> you remember those commercials? They didn't even have the actual products. They just had these characters, PC and Mac, doing all these weird scenes. And in essence, what you should be asking in order to figure out whether you want to build this into your story is, what role do you play to your customers, to anyone that you want to influence in life? It doesn't necessarily have to be about your career. It could be about people that you work with, but it could also be about other roles in your life. As a parent, as a son, as a daughter, it could be about life itself. And you can choose a different persona based on the role you're playing in your story. Sacred words. Sacred words is about something that represents you. 
And this could be a slogan, like the just do it slogan for Nike, or it could be a motto. This could be something that you could do, something that people can remember you by. In my brand, I have chosen to actually put together a slogan just using the simple rules of, you know, seven words plus or minus two because that's what people commit to, can remember for the long term. My motto is that I help transform products into wealth for companies. That's my career motto, slogan. It's not for people, it's actually for the executives and managers of companies that I work for because they understand the power of creating products that lead to margin and wealth for organizations because that is the lifeblood of a successful company. And my clients are executives and senior managers that need help in getting results from the products they have or products that are currently in development. And they know that they've done different things before They've seen that movie again, again and again, and they're not achieving very good results. So I basically come in and assess what's going on, and I help them ensure that whatever products are in the queue are successful in the marketplace. So this is another strategy, and the seventh strategy. The other one is you can choose to become the character. You know, who's the, who, do you, who do you consider a leader? And what kind of leader would you represent? Are you gonna be a superhero? Are you gonna be the villain or supervillain? The arch enemy of somebody? You can choose. Here's my leader, Bill Gates. And I compare, contrast Bill Gates to Steve Jobs that everybody you know, fantasizes about. And I really consider Bill Gates to be a much better leader than Steve Jobs. And here's the reasons why. Both very successful started startup companies that became multinational companies. And they were actually almost like a superhero and the arch enemy of each other, if you really want to talk about PC versus Mac. In reality, the one that has been able to make successful transitions from one career to another, becoming an entrepreneur to a successful CEO of a multinational company to now a global level, world-class philanthropist. Okay, Steve Jobs was, did the two things right, but he never really established himself as a, as a global class, world-class philanthropist. And that I, I really admire about Bill Gates and Melinda Gates. The fact that they have founded their own foundation and are now funding, using their wealth to fund causes that are worthwhile solving. Problems that we could only fantasize about trying to solve. And they're focusing on things that are practical, not for perhaps the average citizen in the US, but to do good around the world. And for that reason, he is my hero, along with Melinda Gates, because of their foundation and all of the causes that they're funding. So those are the seven different tips that you can choose to adopt. And in your handouts are five different sort of takeaways that I would like to summarize with. The reason why you wanna have your own personal story is because especially it's about, if it's about transforming your career or pivoting your career or being able to be successful in getting your next promotion, it would really help if you can identify and define to others who you are and make sure that you are authentic about the way that you're describing yourself. If you do it right, and you use some of these techniques that I spoke about, the story itself that you're creating will set you apart. It would also help you establish <clears throat> credibility and trust when you're meeting someone new. And it will also help you engage your target stakeholders, whether they're your next manager, supervisor, peer, colleague, client. And number five, it definitely will help you make a great, powerful first impression when you're meeting new people. If nothing else, 
they can be your refer your next referral to your next client, your next promotion, perhaps your next career opportunity. You never know when you're meeting people when they're going to connect you. And it's all because whatever you shared with them has captured their imagination, has engaged them. And now they remember you the next time they, they find the right opportunity where you might be a great fit. So that is a summary. And at this point, I would say, I don't know if you have any questions, but I really would like to at least have a, a, couple, of, a couple of questions from the audience if, if, you, if you have any questions. I, I really want to say that right now, as I, as I started my career, thinking that I was going to become a doctor and actually dipped a little bit into biomedical uh, engineering at the very beginning at the graduate level, I realized very quickly that it was a very long, long career and very little ability to have good income as a, as a medical student. And that's been really the struggle of, of anyone who has decided to become a doctor. Here in the U.S., 12 years of school after high school. Total of 24 years of education when you add it all up. That is a long, long time. And in the meantime, you've got very low income. So unless you have, you're in a good position where you have a trust fund or parents who are able to afford this or a combination of getting great scholarships, it's a long, hard career. But now that I, have begun working as a consultant, I have actually started focusing on helping entrepreneurs get started. And I started this and made a decision to shift my career in not only helping executives and senior managers in mid-market and large enterprises, but also helping out those that were just struggling trying to start up their own business. Because many of them need a lot of help. Question. Did a pivot, right? So yes. What was, what was the epiphany moment where you figured out that you needed that you needed to pivot? There have been several pivots. That's a great question. <laughs> several pivots. The, the first one? So this is the, this is one of the ones that kind of went around round trip. So the last year or so, I've been focusing on helping out and just providing pro bono consulting to entrepreneurs that need help, and I've been setting up ongoing monthly appointments with anyone that is local that needs help. I actually met Jeff back in July of this year, and we started a conversation. Found out that he's here, came from Pasadena with his family because his wife is a doctor doing a surgery internship, and the only place that selected her around the nation was MedStar in DC. So they had to move. And that career to become a surgeon, specialty, it's another five years. With some salary, but hours of, you know, they're working, her, her shifts can be actually 36 hours or, or more. And here they came, the two of them, with two kids, and he had to leave his career to come out here for her to continue her career when they have no family and he's playing dad to the two kids because dad and mom because mom is working crazy hours. We started talking and he was actually in a role uh, where he was actually looking at commercialization of ideas that come from NASA JPL where he worked. So we started talking, I said, hey, I also was at NASA for some time. So we started talking and after a while, he actually asked me, I really have been thinking about my only option is to start my own company and start this idea, which I have been working on. Long story short, we now co-founded a company called vSense Medical Devices, and it is technology that we're applying into healthcare. We're creating the next set of products of intelligent connected devices that Without touching anyone, we can read your heartbeat from across the room. This particular device we envision would be the kind of device that allow people to seamlessly live their lives 
while we're still collecting information that is vital when you have certain conditions and you have a specialist or a healthcare provider who wants to see this information on a daily basis. No need to connect, no need to do anything else except just go about your life and we will provide that information as needed to your healthcare provider. It's a great thing. Right now I've been having fun of working very long hours to put together our prototype system, which is Peter. And I've been working with Peter along with other people and it's given me an opportunity to really work closely, not just with Jeff, but also other people that I've actually have met in the last few years that have, that where we do need help because this is actually a project where we're taking this idea that was a radar solution using low power radio FM waves and be able to uh, read reflections and be able to sense it in a, in a, uh, do a lot of number crunching in essence that will actually allow us to uh, scan without touching subjects and we can get respiration rate and heartbeat and we envision that this will be only the start. The start of smart connected devices that will be touchless. And if you guys are, you know, sort of like um, in a, in a diff from a previous generation, and I won't give away my age, but if you're a Trekkie and you've been the, the, the original Trekkie fan and you remember Dr. McCoy, mm -hmm. Bones, with a tricorder, this is exactly what we're talking about, a tricorder. And the technology is there today. Simple fact. It's just that the fact is that right now, applications have been in other fields. We're now repurposing those type of te te technologies to create the next generation of medical devices. So that's my story. So going back to, to uh, sharing, uh, so that's been a pivot because I actually pivoted from being a full-time employee to being a consultant to now helping out entrepreneurs who are not necessarily my target market because they really can't afford you know, my services, I basically have been doing a lot of this work pro bono and that pro bono work has driven, you know, has given me an opportunity that by putting, working with Jeff, pre-revenue, put together a business plan and started looking for funding and we got accepted into an accelerator program that we started in September and we got funded by a firm out of Silicon Valley. Wow. Now that we had the funding, <laughs> thank you. So I'm actually heading to California with Peter and Jeff next week to actually do a couple of demos on investors because we know that we are looking for the next level of investment to continue the company and things are looking really good right now. We, uh, I can only say that with the kind of people that we've been able to get involved, it's incredible the fact that now I'm starting to connect all those things that I've been doing and meeting new people and they're really starting to pay, pay off. Yes. You got uh, security engineers on your team? <laughs> so the answer is yes, we will need security. And uh, there's a lot of uh, already platforms that are HIPAA compliant, and we will need that uh, before we go to market. And uh, in essence, right now we're working with uh, uh, actually Phil, who's our uh, architect, to make sure that w our solution will be a cloud-based solution that is secure. But in essence, we will need to build all those things. Any other questions? Yes. Hector, regarding uh, the personal story, when in an interview situation, how uh, much depth or how long should you go into this elevator speech to convey it correctly? So it all depends on how many floors that building th <laughs> is. <laughs> What I do and what I recommend is that you actually have a portfolio of elevator pitches. Kid you not, I mean, I had a, actually, I'm right now today teaching a class today and tomorrow that is about product marketing and we actually talk about the process of developing your messaging platform of which the elevator pitch is only one of several elements. But when it comes to developing an elevator pitch, it's actually a set of elevator pitches because you must be prepared to have a 15 second 30 second, 45 second, 90 second, three minutes, five minutes, and beyond. Because literally, you really don't know who you're going to be bumping into at an elevator, a coffee shop, at a restaurant when you're meeting someone new. And you find that sometimes you really have to be prepared to hit the mark. Because once you know who you're talking to, 
and that how they fit into your vision as to where you want to go, you can pitch the right thing and that's very powerful. People will remember you, that's just for that. Yes? My question is similar with the personal story. I can, I'm a creation story, but then the other parts of it, the icons, the pagan, the all the, 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 the whatever it is, how do you, I mean, for people who are transitioning, who are looking to um, stand out, you know, in, in an interview, how do you put all of that in there? I mean, or, or are you just, I mean, I, I, I can't envision going in and singing a jingle, you know, that I made about myself, and then, you know, they'll remember me, and, okay, <laughs> That's a great question. Well, what I start is I make it, I keep it simple. I actually continuously look at ways, opportunities to update my resume because the messaging platform, whatever it is, it's going to get deployed somehow. And, and usually we'll de get deployed in things that are usual part of your search process, like a cover letter, a resume. But before you can even present all that, you actually have to repackage that same information in different ways and actually deploy it through your LinkedIn profile, for example. How many of you have a LinkedIn profile? You know that my LinkedIn profile today, I'm connected to over 2,000 individuals directly, first, which gives me access to, I think it's over 60 million people worldwide. And I use that heavily because my summary in my profile is always changing. The reason why is because I use that as being my first primary target of people who actually are searching about me will see my profile first before they even approach me. And so I put in my summary, I take full advantage of the 2,000 words that you're limited at to actually put everything that I share because I know that I usually have maybe two or three different stakeholders, types of stakeholders that I'm targeting in my summary one of them is about my next opportunity, my next set of clients. And so that's number one is it gets deployed in LinkedIn. And then there's consistency when you look at my image, which is my photo on LinkedIn. I use Twitter strictly for business, not for social. And everything that I'm tweeting or retweeting is about what I do. And it's the same picture that I'm using, same description, same slogan between my Twitter account and my LinkedIn account. And I'm not a Facebook user, but if I was, I would clearly say Facebook would be for one thing and one thing only, and that is whatever is gonna create revenue for me. And I would make it in such a way that I would uh, align it very closely to either my own personal website, which I also have, and it's all based on my LinkedIn profile. So everything starts from my summary and people, you know, if they're interested, they actually will scroll all the way down to see all my different careers. And I will also include a lot of the work, whether I'm getting paid or not, I will actually in, you know, include that in LinkedIn. Things like, you know, being the marketing director for Project Management Day of Service. These are all things that even though I'm not getting paid, you never know who's gonna actually going to read that information and will need help at some point in doing something similar that may lead to an engagement, may lead to, a, to a, a, the next opportunity. Something you said uh, just triggered something. You update your summary frequently. And I think every time you update your summary, all your contacts get uh, notified that your summary was updated. You can turn that off. Okay, that's optional. So it's optional. There's a, a settings that you can actually turn that off. Uh, so you uh, and you, you can decide whether you want to inform everyone or not. Uh, I choose because I, I do this on an ongoing basis and may not necessarily want to be uh, paying that type of attention. I just let it because I'm, now I'm mostly looking at inbound communication. You know, those that are searching for something and I know that I've got to include certain keywords that are critical for the type of opportunities that I'm looking for and that I'm also sharing my values and my res the results of anything, everything that I've accomplished for specific roles. And that's the most important thing because that's what people will, that's what will trigger people to want to connect with you, number one. Number two, they'll want to contact you directly. Yes. So I was lucky enough to uh, attend one of uh, Hector's uh, branding sessions, uh, working session uh, earlier this year. 
and I don't know those of you that have seen my uh, business card, it says I heart cats. And that was the slogan and the branding that I came up with because that's what I do as a project program manager. And I use my people skills to, to lead rather than force. So thank you, Victor. All right. <laughs> Great. Yes, question. I had a couple things. Um, the first thing is, where can we take your product uh, marketing class? Ah, good thing you should ask. So here's product <laughs> ma management data service. I would not, I, I couldn't get away. I thought Laura was going to be here, so that's why I inserted this slide. But if you haven't signed up, sign up today. PIMDAS.org and go to volunteer, and it's a one pager. Submit your information, credit card with 20 bucks tax deductible, because it goes to a 501c3 organization, and sign up. I will be there next month. And yes, it is next month already. I, this is stuff for entrepreneurs. I'm also a co-organizer of a meetup called Startup Central. It, we built this from just a few hundred to now over 4,000 entrepreneurs from the DC, Baltimore metro areas. And we have ongoing activities. And these are the courses that I'm teaching, and I'm actually uh, an instructor for a consulting firm called the 280 Group, which is out of Silicon Valley. And I offer all the courses I offer, I focus on courses here in D.C. and Seattle and Boston. And here's the uh, information on that. Right now, the offering is actually I, I, I had Monday, Tuesday offering, and then yes, uh, today and tomorrow it will be the second course. But there's some additional ones uh, that are already announced for spring of next year. So you can go to the website and get information and then contact me directly uh, at that particular email address and I can send you information on how to sign up for the next offering that will be here in DC. And then I also just wanted to make a comment. So I'm a uh, blogger slash social media influencer. And our personal brand, our story is like we are our product. And so sometimes though I struggle with that because I don't, I mean, I, I, I inject my story into everything that I create, whether it's a Facebook you know, status update, whether it's a tweet, my about page, but sometimes I wonder if it's too much. Like, to share? That, too much? As long as you're getting the positive reaction, I mean, let me ask you this, how are you gauging the number of views or the reaction? Is it positive, negative? Are you, how, how are you collecting feedback from those that are viewing the information? Sometimes I do, well, probably about once a year I do surveys. Mm -hmm. um, the feedback that I get is you're very down to earth, you're approachable. Um, and I think that's because I share my story so often. Mm -hmm. um, just, it could be when I was 12, this is what I was like. Just telling me a little bit about me and everything that I do and not just say, oh, here's how to use a power tool. It's, you know, well, I was just like you. I didn't know how to use power tools and then I did this. So there's, there's, a transition from I was like you and then I did this and then now I can do this. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's it's it works for my regular readers but sometimes I wonder how much it might be off-putting to the people that find me and say search we're looking to you know they've got a problem and they just need a quick solution where they're trying to get to the meat of what their the solution is but then there might be all this story surrounding it so sometimes I kind of struggle with how much story to actually put in like the content that I'm putting out there. So what I would recommend, because this is a struggle, is that you start with this and you just start adding, adding, adding. What you need to do is start dividing and repackaging your content into basic versus for those that are sort of like medium you know, knowledge to those that are experts but looking for specific expertise that they haven't done before. And that is purely repackaging of the information. It may take you some time to figure out what are the best you know, consume topics that you might consider building into different levels and mm -hmm. start with something that is, you know, what you might have right now is just something that is basic for anyone who's just starting out. Mm -hmm. But you now you need to start tweaking it, repackaging it for people who have done some, you know, do DIY projects that now they're looking to do different ones and ones that have done a lot of experience with DIY, but now they're looking for very specific knowledge on something very specific and make it in such a way that it's that you can, you can find it through keywords. 
but that may be additional work and just repackaging and maybe editing some of the content that you already have to repackage and just start, you know, making it easy for people to find. So this is the, inf the information on the workshop. It's a four hour workshop and actually this is coming up. Uh, I'm not really sure that this is going to be uh, actually help because right now I, I haven't had a chance to actually uh, market this. But I am going to tell you that I have teamed up with uh, someone else, Heath Thoddleson. I don't know if you've met him. He does one that is about sales. And we're teaming up to make this into a one-day workshop in February. It'll be local. And I will work with your VP of Education to make sure that it is announced uh, to the chapter. And we're, we're going to be providing some uh, promotions to if you want to sign up. It'll be a full day, eight PDUs. And it will contain this content that I will do on my own as part of, of the one day that will walk you through how to go about developing your own personal brand and get into the how-to of these techniques. So with that, if there are any other questions, here's my contact information. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can also go to my personal website and you can also go to Twitter and follow me and um, you know, share, and if you like the content, it, this is where you can find it on SlideShare. This is a short URL where you can find the slides, but you can also download this as a PDF and those two URLs that are at the top. And if it's, I didn't have a chance to include it in, in your handout, but you can write it down and uh, go there, or you can find me on SlideShare and you'll find the information. So with that, I want to thank you very much for your, all your attention and hope to see you. Happy holidays. Great, have a great new year. And I hope to see all of you at Project Management Day of Service next month. Thank you. Another round of applause for Hector. And Hector, thank you very much. This is our token of our appreciation, our coin, and our, your certificate. So thank you again. Great, thank you.